up till just last year. I'm proud to, to note that I have some similar past as Dr. Surin, as we were both American Field Service scholarship students, and um, he was in the 60s, and I was just 10 years later. <laughs> However, he went to the other Cambridge, where Harvard is, for his MA and PhD in, 19, in 1974 and 1982, um, respectively, in the field of political science and Middle Eastern studies. Hence, Dr. Surin is a Harvard-trained diplomat and politician. He also studied Arabic and conducted research at the American University in Cairo from 1975 to 1977, while he was a fellow at the Higher Institute of Islamic Research in Cairo, Egypt. On his return to Thailand, he taught at Tamasat University, and he rose up the ranks to become the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Thailand, from 97 to 2001, while writing voraciously for two leading English daily newspapers in Bangkok from 75 to 92. In 1999, while serving as chair of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, ASEAN Regional Forum, he was instrumental and led efforts to get governments, the United Nations, and the international community to bring peace and security in East Timor. Dr. <coughs> Pitsuan is currently on the advisory board of the United Nations Human Security <coughs> Trust Fund and the International Crisis Group, a member of the International Advisory Board of the Council on Foreign Relations in New York, and is also the International Academic Advisor of the Center for Islamic Studies at Oxford University. So, without much uh, further ado, let me now invite Dr. Surin Pitsuan, the Honorable Dr. Surin Pitsuan, to please take his seat. Excellencies, Vice Chancellors, Professors, Ladies and Gentlemen, if you notice, I am an hour early. <laughs> because Dan Sri, because Dun, I know, Yang Muhammad, Datuk Sri Mustafa Muhammad is now engaged in a political ritual. <laughs> called the dissolution of the parliament. I have been through that seven times in my life and I know how unsettling the feeling could be. But this is a role that people in the age of ASEAN community in the age of globalization will have to assume quite often. And I mean, what you are asking me to do is to deliver a keynote address even before the conference is officially opened. <laughs> I raise this issue because life in the age of community, ASEAN, and life in the age of globalization will be full of improvisations. You have to be able to adjust, you have to be able to react and improvise constantly. Five years at ASEAN have brought me to a realization that from now onward, university, schools, teachers, will 
have to prepare students, younger generations, for at least three or four careers in their life. It is no longer true that you first graduate as an accountant and you will continue to be an accountant for the rest of your life. That's not true at all. It is no longer true that you become a nurse in the beginning and you will remain a nurse until the end of your career. Now, there are choices in the new landscape of the economic community of ASEAN and certainly there is tremendous spectrum, wide spectrum of choices in the global community. So we are talking about preparing our students for the future. We are talking about instilling certain skills that they will be using, they will need for the rest of their life. Less facts, less information, and less memorization. Now, how do you instill that skill of analysis, of integration, of problem solving into the younger generation so that they can live with those skills for the rest of their life because they will need those skills for the rest of their life in their adjustment, in their improvisation, in their accommodation of all the changes that are inevitably going to take place around them and uh, within their <coughs> career. <clears throat> so today you are talking about redesigning the relationship for government, business community, and university. You are very ambitious indeed. I don't know if you are talking about the old government or the new government coming in. <laughs> but this is an issue that every academic community in the world has to face and has to manage. How to synthesize the works and the knowledge and the wisdom of the university and the production of the business community and the enabling environment that government must create for the two relationships, for the two entities, university and the business community to work together in order to bring out the products which we call knowledge that can be applied in the factories, in the business entities that would come out as services for the community, as products for the community. ASEAN is aspiring to integrate all these things. We want to move goods that are being produced in all the 10 countries of ASEAN. We want to open borders and markets for all these goods and all these services, education, health, telecommunication, tourism. All these services must also be allowed to flow cross border. And in some cases, you don't even have to cross borders to access to services. I use this phone from Bangkok, calling anywhere in the world. Sometimes I have to go through Malaysia, sometimes I have to go to, through Singapore without knowing it. That's accessibility of services. In health, you can benefit from consultancies of the best surgeons you have here in Kuala Lumpur. And clients can be in Jakarta, clients can be in Bangkok, or clients can be in Manila asking for help 
asking for advice, asking for consultancy from Euro medical university, medical schools in Bangkok. So you access to services without having to move yourself. We would like to help the flow of that access of that service and uh, accessibility to that, to those services too. And then the capital will have to go through. The investment will have to go through. Otherwise, there won't be an economic community. So, we are creating a landscape that universities will need to come in and fill the gap. Because the landscape that is being made leveled will not be productive until knowledge comes in, until investment comes in, until innovators come in, until entrepreneurs come in. More and more jobs in ASEAN need to be created by the people themselves. It used to be that you graduate from universities, you go and find jobs. That's the old model. That's the old setup, old structure. You teach, you help them to become certain professionals. They go out and find jobs in the traditional market. But in the age of the community, in the age of globalization, your students must be able to create their own jobs through their own innovation. How do you get them to have that skill, to have that ability, to have that confidence and expertise, to go out to the landscape and create opportunities and create jobs for themselves? So, what we are trying to do in ASEAN is to make sure that whatever you produce, your brain products, can be taken out into the manufacturing sector, into the factories, out as products, out to the market, in ASEAN and outside of ASEAN. The challenge for all ASEAN economies is this. So far, our model of growth has been based on import of investment, import of technology, import of management, then in the end, a lot of the products that we produce with those three component components from outside will eventually be exported out to the world market. What do we get here? We get the price of our labor, which is very little, very minimal. And the big chunk, major chunk of profits will have to go back to the people with the intellectual property. Will have to go to the people who own the capital. Will have to go back to the people who manage these enterprises on our landscape. And that is why most of us are at risk of being caught in this, what we call, the middle income trap. This middle income trap, meaning the people or the economy can never go beyond $10,000 per capita, per head, per year. In ASEAN, only two countries have made it beyond 10,000, far beyond 10,000. Brunei, 
what we don't need to talk about Brunei, it's a special case. Bruneians walk on the beach, they kick a stone, they have gas coming up. So we leave them alone. Brunei, a special story. Singapore. Singapore has achieved a level of economic progress. As if you measure per capita income, it's higher than Japan, it's higher than Korea, higher than Australia, higher than many of the European countries. It's about 45,000 US dollars a year per head. The next country in ASEAN, among the 10, that will make it, this is a secret for all of you, is Malaysia. Because 20 plus years ago, Dun Mahathir said, by the year 2020, Malaysia will be a developed, a rich income country. And you have seven more years, less than seven years, I think you will make it. Because right now, Malaysia, your per capita income, I know in this room you have more than that, but the <laughs> average capital and uh, per capita income of all Malaysians stands at 9,600 plus US dollars. You are only a couple of hundred shy of that $10,000 per head per year. So congratulations, Malaysia. I'm not campaigning for any party. <laughs> <laughs> but you are going to make it. The challenge for ASEAN is, how about the rest? Seven more. My own country has been developing for the last four decades from 1,000 plus per capita to now only 5,000 plus per capita. Only half of that 10,000 dividing line. Indonesia is the largest economy in ASEAN, but it has also the largest population, 245 million. So the per capita income is less than Thailand, but it is the largest. Thailand is the second largest. Now, we are at risk of being caught, seven of us, in that middle income trap. How to get out of that? Technology. Innovation. Synergy between and among the universities. Across the landscape of ASEAN, so that we can produce knowledge. Not just graduates, but we produce knowledge. And that knowledge must flow out of our laboratories into the marketplace. The question is, how much do we invest in innovation, in research, in design, in development? I hate to say, the only country that spends enough is the country that doesn't have anything else but the quality of the people. Very small, at the end of this peninsula. <laughs> Singapore. Singapore is spending about 2.48% of its <coughs> national budget, no, not, not budget, GDP. All the economic growth, productivity of the country 2.48% spent on research, development, and design. The rest of us, including Malaysia, spends less than 1%. Now, for the countries that have made it, Japan, Korea, I mean South Korea, Sweden, Finland, the US, Germany, the UK, France, for those countries that have made it, in this knowledge economy, they spent no less 
than 2 3% of their GDP in research, in development, in design. So the government needs to make that decision. Universities need to make that decision that from now on, we just don't teach. We just don't produce graduates, however qualified. We must spend some part of our resources for innovation. And that innovation will not happen until we have a system of synergy among us and between us. Because knowledge doesn't grow in a vacuum. Knowledge doesn't grow in a void. Knowledge grows when you have cross breeding among and between knowledge workers scientists so Sunway University will have to work with University of Dara will have to work with Prince of Songkhla University will have to work with University of the Philippines will have to work with University of Indonesia and the rest We have to look at ASEAN as an expanded landscape, much like the entire European continent, where centers of excellence in science, in technology, in innovation could be found in every member state. And you don't have to be strong in everything, but you choose to be strong in the areas that you can be strong in. We are not going to fight with Bangkok, on, with, with Thailand, on food production. Because they have the land area. Because they have a long history of technological transfer for food production. But then again, Thailand is not going to compete, or anybody is going to compete with Malaysia for palm oil production. And none of us are going to compete with, with, with Singapore for the service industry that they have. My point is this. In Europe, centers of excellence in aviation research, avionics, Everything to do with flying can be done anywhere in the 27 countries of Europe. Telecommunication can be done in Finland or Sweden. But when you finish all these products in all these universities, centers of excellence, the products must be sent to a city called Toulouse in southern France to produce Airbus. You don't have to produce Airbus everywhere. But you can do research on all the components of that Airbus everywhere. Choose certain subject that you can be best in. In America it's the same thing. It happens to be one country. But electronic parts of this economy, the science of, eco of, of electronics, can be done at MIT, can be done at universities, state universities of New York, can be done in Chicago. Avionics can be done in Texas in Florida, but once it comes to the production, you go to where Boeing is. So, ASEAN must do the same thing. That we have scattered centers of excellence in our knowledge production, and we help each other 
piping all this knowledge into production base. If it is about food production, you send it up to time. If it is about electronic industry, research everywhere, Jula Longkorn, University of Philippines, the Bandung technology, you send them to Malaysia because you are strong in electronic industry, manufacturing. And that's what the ASEAN University Network is doing, should be doing, must be doing. And that's what ministers of education of every country must do. That is, look at the collaboration, look at the opportunity for collaboration, and look at the potential of all these brains available on our landscape and try to get the best out of them. I don't know about here. I can speak about Thailand. Every 25 years, we send a new batch of scientists to be trained at MIT, at Caltech, at University of Los Angeles, at Berkeley, at Harvard. Why every 25 years? Because when they come back, we put them into the classroom to teach. Whom do they teach? They teach teachers. And what do these teachers do? They go and teach at high school level. There is no opportunity for them to grow their own knowledge. To incubate their own innovation. Teach, teach, teach. Nothing wrong with teach but you will be intellectual property dependent forever into the future. Because we don't produce our own intellectual property. So, what we need to do is to make sure that we have laboratories as well as the classrooms. That our teachers, our professors, and our students will do research as much as doing the knowledge, learning. We must produce science, technology, and knowledge, and intellectual properties, as much as we do the transmission of knowledge in the classrooms. And once we have the knowledge and the lab, we need another modem to speak the computer language. We need a transmission gadget so that the knowledge produced in the laboratories can be nurtured, can be embellished so that the industry and the business can pick them up and put them through their production line their own factories coming out as products at the end of the process for actual marketing and consumption to generate more growth in our economy. Now, that transmission gadget, that modem, has to be very, very effective. Managing the products of research, innovation, into the marketplace. In, in the US, there are a lot of these things. In between Harvard and MIT, there is something called Kendall Square. I feel very good being put up in this hotel. In the middle of the resort, Madame B. In the middle of the shopping complex. But the message in the hotel room is always about Sunway University, Sunway University. And Mr. Jeffrey Chia himself have been listening over and over in the past 10 hours <laughs> that I'm very much inspired by John Harvard, whom 300 plus years ago,
produce Harvard University, which is now blah 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 blah. If it were other other hotel, it would have been what's the casino you have, <laughs> massage parlor you have, <laughs> and the shopping centers you have. Here, you choose, or at least the management choose to talk about Sunway University over and over and over. I'm very impressed. But, but here is the trick. Every university system must create that <coughs> transmission line from the products of the laboratories of that university or of a collection of universities, Harvard, MIT, Kendall Square. And the business there is doing nothing except trying to make sense of what the professor of physics have done with his students, research on this little thing, and how it can be turned into applicable technology. And you see a sprawling uh, high-rise in this thing called Kendall Square. <coughs> and the business is transmission of knowledge from Harvard, from MIT laboratories into the industry in the Northeast, out to Chicago, out to the South, out to the West, the whole 50 states benefit from this little gadget. We don't have that. I don't know if you have it in Malaysia, certainly not in Thailand, and not enough here in ASEAN to make or to market knowledge. Simple as that. To market knowledge, to package that knowledge into something that is sellable, that has economic values right away, rather than having that big volume of research gathering dust on the shelf in the library. That tends to be the case. We need to manage our knowledge and do it well. Japan, Germany, Europe are doing the same thing. Korea are doing the same thing. China is now doing the same thing. For ASEAN not to be caught in that middle income trap, we have to do the same thing. Yeah? Now, business, university, government. That's one of my expertise too. Government usually has a very short span for their interest. They react to pressure today, not the future. And oftentimes, Ministry of Education has the most chunk of the budget, not the most, the largest chunk of the budget. And that's what attracts politicians and political parties. We want to go and manage Ministry of Education because it has the largest budget. budget. Because it has the popular base. Hundreds and hundreds of thousands of teachers, of parents, of students. So education is being looked at being coveted for the wrong reason. Not for the fact that we are shaping the future together. Not for the fact that we are building the ASEAN community competitive, equitable, being able to be, to be integrated into the global marketplace seamlessly we don't have that vision in mind. The only reason we want to go to the to, to Ministry of Education is because it has a lot of budget. A lot of people. It can be our political base. Well, ASEAN member states, I'm saying all this because I have left that position <laughs> behind. ASEAN member states have to make that mental shift 
that from now on, education is our first priority, the first on our agenda. Because we can't prepare our younger generation for competition in the future. For the three or four careers that they will have, they open to them but unable to take because they are not prepared. Because the information that, they, that we put in them are the information that will be either old or will be able to be retrieved from this gadget anytime, whatever you want. You want any statistics, you want any quotation, you want any facts. They're all in here. Our children, our younger generation must be trained to think, to analyze, to solve problems. But politicians and, I'm glad I'm speaking in before Dr. Mustafa, he's a good friend. <laughs> I work with him closely, yeah, Minister of the Economy. But he too has to struggle against this. That for Malaysia to be competitive in the production of your products, his responsibility in the industry, in the export, you need qualified workforce. You don't want to import the technology from outside forever. You want to be able to do homegrown or to, to use homegrown technology and science here. So that Malaysia can be competitive in the production, in the export, in the industry. Dr. Mustafa is in charge of that. So, what we need to do is to make also that mental shift that education is the first agenda of every family in ASEAN. All across. It's nothing more important than the future of the children. In Thailand again, a lot of, a lot of, of government officials are taking the option of what they call early retirement. 55, you said enough. Because even if I continue on, my salary will be the same. I stop now, I have the, what you call that, pension of about the same. So why bother? That is the option now. I don't know about here. But in the future, the five years left, the ten years left, is not going to be used just to stay at home. Because there will be choices. So early retirement in the future will be early retirement for another career. And how do you prepare our children, our future generations, to make use of that large, at least one third of the working period of their life productive? Because that's what we will need. More productivity out of less people. More productivity out of aging people, population. I'm sorry, all of us will be old at some point. So, that's what we have to plan. That's what universities have to help plan. That's what governments have to look into the future and look at options. What do we have from our population, from our scholars, from our universities, from our younger generation, now and in the future? And here is my last message. How, how are you going to help students to think, to analyze, to integrate information, and to be able to solve problems? It is easier said than done, yes. It's easy to come in with a text and, and read to the students, one, two, three, four, five, and ask the student to give it up back to us tomorrow, one, two, three, four, five, and if you slip, five become one, you lose grades. <laughs> Because everything is structured, and we expect them to memorize. Last year was the centennial of Titanic. And an integrated teaching 
of the event of Titanic would be four teachers, math, uh, English, science, math, and social studies, four teachers working together asking one student to write one report on the event of the Titanic. Ten pages, report. The English teacher would just look at the English language. Whether he crossed the T's, whether he dots the I's, whether he put the commas in the right place, whether he used the right tenses. The math teacher would expect that the student will use this formula that he learned to calculate how much of that iceberg is on top, how much of that iceberg is further down. Almost physics, almost math, almost, almost math, almost science. But the science teacher would also expect the student to explain this phenomenon. Why the iceberg at that time of the year? Why it floats down through this Gulf Stream, Northern Atlantic? What happened to the environment? What happened to the atmosphere? What happened to the seasons? The social science teacher would expect the student to, to explain what is the social economic background of the passengers. First class, mostly honeymooners. <laughs> That's a fact. But if you don't ask, the students won't do the research and won't analyze. The second class are mostly salesmen floating between uh, America, North America and Europe. And the bottom are migrant workers either coming back to visit their old families or going to America looking for jobs at the bottom of the ship. What would be the way we teach in traditional schools in ASEAN? We will ask multiple choices. We will ask students the Titanic events, catastrophe took place in one, the Pacific Ocean, second, the Indian Ocean, third, the Atlantic Ocean, and the fourth would be all of the above. <laughs> and believe it or not, there will be students who would say all of the above. <laughs> Why? Because they didn't think. Because they don't analyze. Because they were not taught to integrate information and to solve problems, they were taught to memorize. And you know what they would do? They would flip the coin. And the coin turned out to be D. So it's D, all of the above. How can the Titanic catastrophe took place in all three oceans at the same time? <laughs> I'm not campaigning to become the Minister of Education in Thailand. But coming from the bottom of the society in Southern Thailand, and got the education at Harvard, I know what it takes to change the educational system. Unless we do that, unless we put the universities together, Unless we change the mindset of our educators and our policy makers, ASEAN will be at risk of that middle income trap. Because our universities and our great scholars are not producing what they should be producing. Not graduates, but knowledge. I wish your deliberations in the next few is successful and please help ASEAN find its way out on this issue of university, university collaboration, designing the relationship between university, business and government. I will be waiting for the result of your deliberation. Thank you very much. Wassalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, Mr. Excellency, for the very inspiring and informative speech.